going to be talking about managing reliability with SLOs and error budgets. Uh, I'm going to start by saying I'm Tim, I'm a site reliability engineer and I work for Kudos. Um, it's my day job to look after all that monitoring. Um, and I've previously been an operations manager managing DevOps teams and a Unix system administrator. So what I'm going to talk about is measuring reliability, why we measure reliability, how we measure reliability, service level objectives, server level indicators, and error budgets. So I'm going to start by talking a little bit about reliability and how reliable a service should be. So if you asked, for example, your product team how reliable a service team is, or your directors, they're going to say it should be 100%. 100% it's a good target, but it's pretty much impossible. Um, because even the Earth itself does not have 100% uptime. We've had more than one extinction level event. So if we can't manage to keep an uptime of 100% on the Earth, how are we going to maintain that kind of reliability in a service running in a data center which is on the Earth? So it, it's kind of an unrealistic target. And plus, to put the engineering effort in to make it 100%, if it's just, say, a dashboard that's displaying your coffees, then do you really need it to be 100%? Does it need to be in globally distributed networks? Does it need to be in more than one data center? Do you need to fail it over? Probably not. Probably only needs to be running while you're in the office, right? Um, so you could just run it on a Raspberry Pi, you'd be fine. So how much engineering effort do you need to put into your service to make it reliable enough? Um, so what about 99%? 99% is about eight hours of downtime in a month. Is that good enough? How about 99.9%? .9 That's about 40 minutes of downtime in a month. Is that good enough? So what you need to do is work out how reliable you need a service to be. And that's a lot of conversations with the business on how much it needs to be reliable. Um, and with the product team to be able to talk to them and agree with them that this is the goal that we're aiming for, for a reliability target. So I want to cover some terminology first, because there's some that you might not be familiar with. I'm pretty sure most people are familiar with service level agreements. Everyone heard of those? So these are mostly legal documents that you ha the business has with customers. And it says, if I don't meet this target, we will give you some money back, or we'll give you some service credits. Um, so those tend to be at a legal level. We don't tend to get involved with that kind of stuff. We, it tends to get brought down to We have some input into how reliable we can make a service, but we have no say into what we can put into a legal document. So a way around that is service level objectives, which is defined by Google's SRE book um, as a reliability target. And most people are familiar with this concept. Like uh, in your SLA, you'll have, we will maintain an uptime of 99.9%. If we don't, then you'll get service credits. So they're probably informal at this point, and you might not be aware of them, or you might be aware of them. You might be monitoring them, and that's good. Uh, and the way that you monitor those is with service level indicators. So that is a quantitative measure of how you measure reliability within your service. So service level objectives. So the Google SRE book defines a service level objective as a target value or range of service levels that are measured by an SLI. So that is normally 100% uptime over a month. So, and again, 100% is unrealistic. Let's say 99% over a month. So we try and aim for that, and we can make better engineering decisions on how we meet that target. Um, there are a lot of different types of SLIs. So I talk mostly about availability because it's the most, it's the easiest one that people can relate to because you've probably all done it. You've probably got a monitoring check in Nagios somewhere that's pointing at a service and if it goes down, you go and jump on it. But we also deal with latency. So how slow is the platform being? Quality, is it degraded? Um, is it not returning the right data? Um, we have other ones which are sort of pipeline related, batch workloads or machine learning jobs, where you, you care about the freshness of the data that they're working on. Um, and you, you, you care about the correctness of that data, whether or not that data is 100% correct, and how free and coverage is how many batch jobs are being run at once. Like if you go down to one batch job, that might not be good enough. Uh, and if you're dealing with storage, then durability is another one that you might deal with. Like it's in the Google SRE book because they deal with pretty much everything, but most of us won't really deal with that. Mostly, most of us will deal with request-driven APIs or web servers, that kind of stuff. 
Um, so let's start with a, 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 an example application. Let's say we've got a to-do list application which has a web front end and a database to store your to-dos in it. You just want to tick off your to-dos. So first thing we need to do is come up with an SLO for this. Um, so let's say availability, we're familiar with that. So typically we measure availability as a percentage over a period of time. So let's say we want 99.9% .9 of availability for our service in a one month period. How are we gonna measure that? Like, cause we could, we have no way of, at the moment, knowing whether or not our service is up or down. We need to add monitoring to tell us whether or not it's up or down. But what, what do we monitor? Um, so we need a quantitative measure of how we validate whether or not the service is up or down. Um, and there are many different ways we can do this. Uh, and especially in the talk before, there were a lot of different ways that you can do this. Client-side implementation like APM in JavaScript libraries, running in your browser, which is reporting back um, metrics. Synthetic client probes, that could be Pingdom. It could be New Relic's uh, synthetic probes. Front-end infrastructure monitoring, that could be the metrics that you get from your ALB or your load balancer. Application-level metrics, that could be the stuff emitted from your application, stuff going from StatsD or the APM monitoring tool that uh, <laughs> we just heard about. Or server logs, right at the end of the pipeline when your it's gone all the way through your application and then you've written a log that said, this, didn't, this request didn't work, therefore it's a bad request. And there are pros and cons with a lot of this, like you could do client-side implementation and you get the full pipeline between your, your client, which has a laptop, and your website. But also, you're measuring things like their internet provider, you're measuring things like their laptop, whether or not that's slow, um, things that are beyond your control. Synthetic probes will only happen periodically and they're only going to be against something that's relatively static, like, a ha like a, the splash page or something like that. It's not going to be able to log in and do all that kind of stuff uh, unless you're paying lots of money to, to do that with uh, New Relic or something. Uh, and the front-end infrastructure monitoring, that is again, that you're going to be monitoring everything. So if you get 500 hour in your load balancer, that could be for a fav icon or it could be for your actual login page, which is being problematic. Uh, application level metrics, like if your application isn't running, how do you know it's down if it's not emitting metrics? So coming up with a, a way, and server logs, it is right at the end of the pipeline, right? Like if your application is not running, then it's not making any server logs, therefore how do you monitor it? And it's also for requests that don't even get to the load balancer, how do you monitor those requests? Um, so this is kind of like the pipeline. So you've got right on this side, this is your client, and then right on there is where your server side logs are. Uh, and then the cloud is the bit that you control whether or not that's a data center or an actual uh, public cloud. And then you have like different technologies that you can use to monitor this kind of stuff. Um, and most of this stuff you have to agree with. You, you sit with your engineering team and you talk about how you monitor these things, whether or not you do APM monitoring, which might be a little bit inaccurate because you might have clients in China or Kenya where their internet's quite slow or being blocked. Um, that you can't really control, but your latency might be going through the roof because uh, you can't control that part of the network. Um, and so you, you can need to kind of put your stamp where you want to go and where you think would be best, but understand the pros and cons of each of them. Um, so in our example, let's say we want to choose remote probes. Let's say we want to do pingdom every minute, and we're going to record the HTTP response code from our application uh, and record that into some time series data somewhere, and then we can, we can generate a monitoring alert from that. So our SLO from this point with our SLI is 99% of remote probes sent every one minute return a good response over a one month period. So that's a very quantitative measure. Like we can tell whether or not that's broken or whether or not it's, it's working. Um, and that's where error budgets come in. So error budgets is the remaining 0.1% of that equation. So 99.9% .9 is our target, but the 0.1% that is our acceptable downtime for our application. So we could do things like innovate. We could do things like chaos engineer. We could do things that could potentially impact the reliability of our platform, but have long-term outcomes. Like, like chaos engineering, you find a lot of weakness in your platform if you just have the freedom to be able to poke at it until it breaks and then you go, well, I didn't expect that to happen. So <laughs> having that kind of freedom and having that agreed with the business that we're allowed to do that kind of stuff brings out innovation within the platform and being able to 
to monitor that kind of stuff is quite useful. It's quite a good measure. So for ex our example, let's say that we're p pinging every one minute. That is 43,200 pings in a month. That means that 0.1% of those is 43 probes that can fail. That's 43 minutes of downtime that we could have on our to-do list application to do whatever we want. We could do chaos engineering, we could load test it and see how well it scales, that kind of stuff where we accept the fact that it might not be available during that time. Or you could blow it all on an incident, <laughs> um, pushing out code at a wrong point or pushing out a bug and it takes it all down and it starts to burn out your, your error budget. At that point, you want to try and monitor that and monitor your burn rate and see whether or not you've got enough headroom for the end of the month. If not, then you can make decisions on that that I'll talk about in a minute. But to visualize this in a bit more of a, an, a graph, graphical way, let's say that we have our service and uh, we have talked with product and the business and we have an SLA of 99% and that's been written up. It's a legal document. It's out there. So we then want our... SLO to be 99.9%, which is a lot tighter than our SLA, because ideally we want to be, if we ever breach it, we want to have enough headroom in there that we can do remedial work that we're not having to pay our customers money for unreliability within the platform. And that leaves us this little block at the end, you can't really see the 0.1% of our error budget. And that's what we can use as sort of our innovation. And that's what we monitor um, to see whether or not we are performing against the targets that we've set as, a, as an engineering team and as a product team um, to, to monitor that kind of stuff. Um, so what happens when your error budget gets depleted? What happens if you use up all of that and you're, you've, you've breached your SLO? Well, at that point, you can... You, you sit down and treat it like an incident, like because it is an incident, it, whether or not the, the error budget was depleted because of an incident or whether or not it was depleted because we were doing chaos engineering or whether or not we tried something new and it didn't really work and that kind of stuff, then we can sit down and have a post-mortem about it. And we can talk about whether or not we need more resilience work, whether or not we need circuit breakers and retry loops um, in, in the application to make it more resilient. And you can get these kinds of resilience pieces of works by doing chaos engineering, um, which helps like if you take down your database and your front end just happily churns along but doesn't write any data and it's just dropping data through the floor, then you've learned something new and you can put something in the product backlog to fix that. Um, or you could just stop all deployments to that service for a period of time. So you're saying, we know that we've used all of our error budget for this month. Therefore, we're going to stop product development on that service for now until we've got a period of time where it's stable. Um, and holding a blameless postmortem is, is crucial, especially the blameless part of that. Like if someone did go in there and do chaos engineering and used up all the error budget, you shouldn't be like, well, it's your fault because you broke everything. It, it should be a, how can we stop that from happening in the future? How can we time box that? How can we make the platform more resilient that one person shouldn't be able to use all of our error budget? So this is where the monitoring of this kind of stuff comes in. So we've got our uptime probes. Let's say we put that into a time series data where we can work out some kind of metric to determine our error budget. And this is an example of one, you have all your good requests, all the ones that responded with a 200, um, HTTP 200, against all the, your total requests. So that could include 300s, 400s, uh, 500s, and you'll be able to see by timesing it by 100 as a percentage. Uh, and if that is below, what, you ex what your SLO is, then you've breached your SLO and you should start looking at it. And using these kind of metrics, you can work out your burn rate because once you get that into a time series data, you can do some clever math on it to figure out how quickly you're using your, your error budget and whether or not you need to stop product development, whether or not you need to do more resilience work to sort of build more resilience into the platform. And of course, the number one part of this is documenting all of this. So sitting down with the product team is crucial to make sure that you understand what it is from a client's perspective that they care about. Because ideally, that's what you want to be monitoring is what the clients see. Like if I log on to google.co.com, then 
I expect that page to work, and I'm a customer of those theirs, they expect that. So they put a lot of engineering effort to make sure that page is always up. And their product teams, I'm sure they have lots of product teams to make sure that page is always available. Um, so we need to make sure that we have agreement from the product team um, that this is the target that we aim for to make this, to make this service resilient because otherwise we could put more engineering effort into it and make it multi-regional and put load global load balances and run it between different clouds in case we lose aws for example um, and we put our rationales behind the decisions as well so if we we, we have chosen 95 percent or 50 percent for reliability why did we choose that like is it because we only really use the platform that s certain service during the day or whether or not it's an internal service like a dashboard that like you only look at once a week maybe you don't need all the engineering effort to make it ha um, and any caveats it's like third party slas so for example both aws and google cloud have public slas for compute engine and ec2 instances um, if you put your sla better than theirs, you need to engineer your way around the fact that they could lose an entire region and your, your, SLA is, your SLOs are completely broken by something that's beyond your control. So you can get around that by running it in multiple regions, running it in multiple clouds. And then if, you, if Amazon disappear off the face of the earth, then you've still got a resilient, a resilient service because it can just pull from Azure or it can pull from Google Cloud. Um, and you won't need to worry too much about it but that's a lot of engineering effort to make that so um and then talk about the error budgets in your documentation as well how many probes can fail how do we measure those probes what kind of math are we using to to generate our slo uh, to generate our error budgets and where are they like where are the dashboards that i can look at to say this service is meeting my expectation as a user um okay so if you want to find more information about this kind of stuff, it's in the Site Reliability Engineering books by Google. Um, they do a really good job. Even if you read only the first three chapters of these books, you learn so much about monitoring and not just monitoring small scale systems, but monitoring global systems and how they do that. Uh, especially the Site Reliability Workbook goes into a lot more detail into um, sort of batch workloads and durability of storage systems uh, and how they monitor those and what SLOs they have on that and how they monitor their burn rate and all that kind of stuff. Um, I've also written a blog on most of this stuff. Um, I need to try and pedal that. Um, so, which goes into a lot more uh, detail into how we do it at Kudos. Um, we use Elasticsearch which is quite good. Um, so we feed all of our data into that and then we, we, we generate our error budget from those the time series data in there and that we use Kubana to, to actually visualize it all and watches to alert us when our error budget is up. And that is me. I did it two minutes early. That's good. So. <laughs>